Hello and welcome to Equine Science Talk, Understanding Equine Science. Raw core, or low, deep and round, also known as hyperflexion, has been a heavily debated subject for many years. Today we're going to discuss the scientific evidence and address whether this is a matter of animal welfare. In other words, does it constitute cruelty, abuse or undue suffering? To be clear, we're talking here about low, deep and round, or LDR, in which the horse is ridden behind the vertical and on a strong contact, and not long and low, in which the nose is in front of the vertical and the horse is ridden on a long or loose rein. Long and low is a commonly used exercise which is widely regarded as beneficial to the horse and is not controversial. First, let's look at the definitions given by the FEI, the International Federation for Equestrian Sports. These distinguish between roll cour, which is a product of aggressive riding and therefore forbidden, and low, deep and round, which is not considered aggressive riding and is therefore allowed for up to 10 minutes. So, is this distinction justified? From the scientific point of view, it doesn't make any difference whether the horse is ridden aggressively in roll core or in a less aggressive and more relaxed manner in low, deep and round, or LDR. In both situations, we see similar levels of stress as indicated by behavior, reactions and changes in stress parameters. So, what effect does the 10 minutes of LDR allowed by the FEI have on the horse's anatomical structure, its muscles, tendons and bones? To explain this, I'd like to just show a few of the horse's anatomical structures. Here we have a horse, or rather a horse's skeleton, and I think it's important here to start with the spine. The horse's spine starts with the first vertebra at the top of the neck, called the atlas. It continues down through the cervical vertebra to the thoracic vertebra, the lumbar vertebra, and on into the tail. Note that the neck is S-shaped and is not part of the top line, also, many people still think it is. The nuchal ligament runs into the supraspinous ligament and forms the top line. The nuchal ligament starts where it is attached to the atlas and is attached to the cervical vertebra in several places, as well as to the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra at the withis. It runs into the supraspinous ligament, which runs along the thoracic and lumbar vertebra, past the hips and onto the top of the tail. These are the structures that would change correspondingly if the horse were to be ridden freely, as shown in these two lovely examples in which the horse is free to balance itself. Then we have the situation where the movement of the horse causes the horse's spine to curve slightly along the length of the body. We have a relatively open shape through the neck and a suspension and upwards curve in the cervical, thoracic and lumbar areas of the spine through to the tail. The supraspinous ligament is suspended over the top line and can carry the rider well. The hindquarters are active and with the horse tracking up under its center of gravity, freeing up the shoulders and allowing the forehand to move freely and easily. When a horse is asked for more collection, as we see in this example where the horse is performing a piaf on long reins, or in this example from Africa where an Arabian horse is showing a slightly collected posture, we can see whether the horse has been correctly trained from back to front. That means that the very first thing is to build strength and balance in the hindquarter so that the horse can step under itself better. This lifts the lumbar vertebra and sets them a little further under the rider, as these vertebrae are all connected by the supraspinous ligament. And this moves the weight of the rider slightly back. Through this, the chest and shoulders of the horse are lifted. The shoulders become freer and maybe the horse carries his head a little higher so that there is a little tension in the nuchal ligament. However, it is very, very important that the S-shape of the cervical vertebra is retained and that it remains upright so that the horse has his nose just in front of the vertical. How close to the vertical it is depends on the type and individual conformation of the horse. Additionally, one can look at the footfalls of the horse along with other parameters. In particular, look to see whether the cannon bone and the hind leg is parallel with the forearm. A horse that has been ridden gently and correctly and that can balance itself steps under its center of gravity and the cannon bone and forearm will be parallel. We can see this in this very good example of a dressage horse in extended trot. The cannon bone and forearm are almost parallel and I think that if the photo had been taken just a little later, 
these lines would have been completely parallel. We can see here that this horse is moving freely through its neck and pole, and the nuchal and supraspinous ligaments have the correct tension, which is running from the tail over the back, neck and pole to the horse's mouth. In this picture, this has been lost. Here the nose is behind the vertical, and this has caused a change in the shape of the neck in the cervical vertebra. The horse is no longer able to use his nuchal and supraspinous ligaments properly. We can see that the hind legs are not stepping actively under the center of gravity and the cannon bone in the hind leg is no longer parallel with the forearm. Let's look at this picture. Perhaps it's easier to analyze this one. Here you can see that because the horse is very closed and tight in the head and neck, the S shape of the cervical region has been exaggerated and the horse can't use its nocal ligament probably. This can potentially destabilize the whole spine, therefore the horse is forced to take evasive movements and the hindquarters move back and up. That means the hind legs can't step under the center of gravity and instead the horse trails his hindquarter behind him. You can also see this in this photo where you can clearly see that the croup is high and the hindquarters trailing. The cannon bone in the hind leg is pointing into the ground instead of forwards and the flow from the hindquarters to the front has been broken. Loreen, as a vet specialising in equine teeth, you get to see inside a lot of horses' mouths. What effect does this low, deep and round riding have on the tongue and the surrounding structures? When horses are ridden low, deep and round, the angle between the jaw and the neck is too narrow. Sadly, in many cases, this leads to injuries in the corners of the mouth and on the tongue itself, both pinching and bruising, as well as actual cuts. Also, one often sees a blocking of the hyoid bone or tongue bone, and these problems are reflected through the whole body. When the rider puts too much pressure on the tongue, the hyoid bone becomes blocked, and this impacts on the muscles that go to the head, shoulder and chest. When these muscles are contracted, free movement is no longer possible. For example, when the shoulder is blocked, the forelegs can't swing forwards and can only paddle upwards. This is a vicious circle because the more stiff and tense the horse becomes, the more force the rider needs to get a reaction from the horse. The tongue is no longer able to move freely and the lower jaw cannot relax, although relaxing the jaw is exactly what the rider wants. Has there been any research into the anatomical problems associated with LDR? Yes, a very good study took thermal images of horses' necks in different working positions. For example, in the position you can see here in this photo of a horse being ridden low, deep and round. Here you can see that the upper line of the neck is overstretched and in this area the camera showed that the muscles were cold and receiving poor blood circulation. In the lower neck the muscles are over compressed and showed up as warm. If a horse is ridden in this position for a long time, eventually the upper neck muscles will atrophy because they are not getting enough circulation and the lower neck muscles will be thrown to excessive tension and inflammation. There are lots of different ways of taking scientific measurements of stress in horses. What can you tell us about them? Yes, there are indeed very many different ways of measuring stress levels in horses and these have, of course, been used to find out how horses react to LDR. In one study, for example, levels of the stress hormone cortisol were measured and these were significantly raised in horses that were being ridden in LDR for the first time, while horses that were used to being ridden this way showed hardly any change. That doesn't necessarily mean that's a good thing. It's simply a physiological reaction and a coping strategy. As the body becomes used to a stress, it protects itself from being overloaded with repeated peaks in stress hormones. So, in assessing stress, one should never rely on just one type of measurement and ideally several measures or parameters should be used together. Are there studies on behavioural measures and facial expressions? Actually, there are a few studies on behavior and facial expressions of horses being ridden in LDR. And these show significant changes in horses' behavior and expressions. Primarily, we see that horses start to grind their teeth and bring their tails. And they try to evade the rider. 
usually sideways, and even stamp their feet. This stress becomes even more pronounced when we look at their facial expressions. Here we see that horses show so-called passive-aggressive expressions. That means they have their ears laid out to the sides and we may see the whites of their eyes. We should also consider that in this LDR position, their field of vision is severely limited. We also see that the nostrils are no longer relaxed, but slightly drawn up, as is the upper lip. And we can see here that this horse is not chewing and has a dry mouth, even though saliva is running out of his mouth and the mouth is not closed, as it should be. And we can see that the tongue has a bluish tinge, and that can be a sign that the horse has a slight lack of oxygen to its tongue. And in addition to that, a study was conducted to find out how horses themselves feel about LDR. The horses were ridden through a Y-shaped maze. Turning in one direction was followed by a short spell of riding in LDR, while turning in the other direction was followed by riding with the nose on or just in front of the vertical. The horses were then allowed to choose which direction to turn, and they very clearly avoided the LDR direction. Talking of the horse's choice, horses also have preferences when it comes to rugs, so look out for our video on that topic. You can leave your questions and comments below, and don't forget to click on the link to subscribe to the Equine Science Talk channel.